when I say things like ayahuasca, LSD, or magic mushrooms, what comes to your mind? You might think about vibrant neon colors, visual distortions, uh, wild partying, and if you're my age, and I see a few people in the audience who are, you might think of flower power, the 60s, and you might even remember the song White Rabbit, one pill makes you larger and one pill makes you small. I actually wanted to sing that, but I don't want to ruin your afternoon, so I, I'll, <laughs> I'll just say it out loud. And you may have heard stories about people jumping out of buildings or running around naked in the streets, but maybe at the end of the day, I can convince you that psychedelics have a way more important role to play. They may actually hold the key to helping a lot of people who are suffering from mental health conditions. We are living in an era of a mental health crisis, and I think, like you, you'll see it all around you. And I see it all around me, in my friends, my family, my colleagues, and increasingly at the university where I work, I see it in my students as well. They have great difficulty in coping with the demands and expectations that are put onto them. And a recent report from the World Health Organization stated that 1.3 billion people in the world are suffering from mental health conditions. And Research at the World Economic Forum have calculated that the total cost of mental health nowadays and by 2030 is estimated to rise to $6 trillion. And to put it in perspective, that is more than the cost for cancer, diabetes, and chronic respiratory illnesses combined. So it's clearly a huge problem in our society. Take my friend Sam, for example, who I've known since he was a child. And ever since adolescence, he has been suffering from depression, which basically means that every day is a struggle for him to get through life. He has difficulty in sleeping. He has trouble in waking up. He hardly ever eats, and when he eats, it's usually not very healthy. And basically, his whole life evolves, it revolves around the depression. He hardly has any joy in life. And Everything he does feels like a chore. In a way, you could say he looks at the world through a glass darkly. And he told me one of his biggest problems is what he calls his inner critic. It's a voice in his head that he has known since childhood and it continuously criticizes him and puts him down. And he said the only way he can deal with that is by just avoiding anything that is remotely challenging or out of the ordinary and just try to get on with the day. And you probably have such people in your environment as well, and in your family or friend. So why is it that mental health conditions put such a burden on patients, their loved ones, and society as a whole? Well, one of the main reasons is that we have not very good tools to help those patients and to treat them. Sam, for example, has been treated with all kinds of different antidepressants for at least 10 years, and it doesn't really help him much. And Sam is not alone. Um, a conservative estimate suggests that about 30 to 40% of all patients do not respond properly to antidepressant treatment. And for those who do, we know that it takes six to eight weeks when you start therapy before you see any meaningful improvement. And when you do, you'll have to take the medication basically for the rest of your life. If you don't, then in most patients, the depression will come back with a vengeance once you stop taking the medication. Okay, so why do we think that psychedelics may make any meaningful improvement? And what are psychedelics anyway? The word psychedelic comes from the Greek word psyche, meaning soul or mind, and dalein, which means, means to manifest. So the idea is, and it implies, that psychedelics can manifest or unfold hitherto unexpected potential of your mind. In a way, you could say it al might allow you to see the world through a glass 
less darkly, more transparent. Now, psychedelics have been around for a long period of time. Probably since thousands of years, psychedelic plants like um, psychedelic mushrooms and peyote cactuses have been used in ceremonial settings. But research into that effect of psychedelics in the Western world started in the 1950s, the last century. Um, unfortunately, due to a number of different reasons that we don't have time to go into, in the 1960s, the political climate changed. And as a result, in 1968, all uh, the possession of psilocybin and psychedelics in general was made illegal and all research came to a screeching halt. That is until about 15 years ago, when several different groups of researchers started to become interested in the therapeutic, potential therapeutic effect of psychedelics again. And typically what those procedures are is, it is a combination of one or maybe two doses of a psychedelic drug, <laughs> typically psilocybin, but sometimes LSD, um, together with psychological support. Psychological support before you take the drug, while you're taking the drug, and, and psychological support after it. A concept that we call psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And the results so far have been intriguing and I dare to say baffling. For example, a very famous study that was done in uh, Imperial College in London, where they took 20 patients who, like Sam, were what we call therapy resistant. So they had been given three or four different antipsychotic drugs and nothing helped. They were given two doses of psilocybin, one with one week interval between them, and their depressive symptoms were evaluated throughout the study. But what the study showed was that within a week, the symptoms were dramatically reduced. Both the clinicians and the patients themselves said the symptoms were dramatically reduced. But more impressive, at least for me, was that the study lasted for six months. And after six months, at the end of the study, the symptoms were still dramatically reduced six months after the drug was taken. So how is it possible that symptoms can have such a long-term beneficial effect long after the drugs disappeared from the body? But before we can answer that question, we first have to make sure that that is actually replicable, right? It could be just a one-off. So let me show you one more study. This was a study done in New York City, New York University, and what they did here was they looked at depressive and anxiety symptoms in patients with life-threatening illnesses. Many were suffering from terminal cancer. And the format was very simple, very similar to the previous study, except that they only gave one dose of psilocybin, and they followed those patients. And what you see here is that within a day, depression and actually anxiety symptoms were dramatically reduced. And again, it lasted for six months. Actually, it lasted longer. The same patients were followed up several years later. And as you can see here, four and a half years later, after this one dose of psilocybin, the patient still had a 60% reduction in anxiety and depressive symptoms. How is that possible? Well, the short answer is, we don't know. Sorry, but I'll try and make it a little longer. It's not so surprising, you know how complicated the brain is. But what we have learned about the brain in the last 10 or 15 years has been quite amazing, and it's very, it's changed our view of the brain. What we now know is that the brain is way more dynamic than we ever thought it to be. Actually, by the time you go home today, your brain will be different from what it was this morning. Your heart, your liver, your lung, they'll all be the same, but your brain will be different. And that's easily to explain because let's say next week, for instance, you might see me on the street and hopefully you'll recognize me. 
That's because your brain cells are now making new connections. And with a bit of luck, you might even remember something about psychedelics and how interesting they can be, because that means they did a good job. And so your brain cells are continuously changing and to continuously changing the way they talk with each other. And that has led to the idea that our behavior is determined by functional connections between different brain regions that we call networks. Functional connections within the network and between those networks. And we have a number of different networks and one of them that I am very interested in is what is called the salience network. And that's basically the network that um, allows you to direct your attention to what is important. And again, you can imagine that that is, must, have, be, must be very flexible because now, hopefully, you will pay attention to me because I'm important, well, a little bit. But in an hour's time, you'll get hungry and you would be paying more, much more attention to the restaurants around you. So you see how this, these cells continuously have to change the connectivity and the way they talk with each other. Now the most intriguing of those networks is what we call the default mode network. And that's the network that's active when we are awake, but at rest. So we're not doing anything. And we think that that network allows us to think about ourselves and reflect upon ourselves and our world. So how do psychedelics influence that? I've tried to explain it in, with um, a diagram. So the different colors here are the different networks. So you have a number of different networks and the thickness of the line tells you how well those, within the network those cells communicate with each other. And so you can see that under normal conditions you see a lot of activity within networks but not so much activity between networks. Now, if you give psilocybin, you see a completely different picture. First of all, the connections within the network become weaker, but the connections between the networks becomes a lot stronger. Interestingly, especially within the default mode network, the activity goes down. And we think that that means that it allows us to reset and to rethink about ourselves and possibly see ourselves in a different light through a glass less darkly, so to say. All right, so, so what about Sam? Well, Sam actually was in one of those clinical trials and he said the most important thing that happened while he was in that trial was that during his psychedelic experience, he had a conversation with his inner critic. And he said, you know, this thing where you constantly are putting me down and criticizing me, I really don't want that anymore. And to his surprise, the inner critic said, oh, okay, then I'll stop. <laughs> and, you know, after the session was over, the voice was gone. And years later, the voice is still almost entirely gone. And when it does crop up, he basically knows how to deal with it. And since, not, since then, he can finally enjoy his life. So I think that psychedelics have a lot of potential for the treatment of depression and anxiety, and I hope I can convince you a little bit of that as well. And there is also more research showing that it might be important for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorders and drug addiction as well. But we are at a critical point now. We still have to learn a lot. All these studies have been done with very carefully selected small groups of individuals, and we have to be careful. Um, and we don't know yet what happens if we use it in a broader scale. Having a long-term effect can be a blessing, but it can be a curse as well. So we really have to uh, make sure that we don't make the same mistake as happened in the 60s where people had this idea that we could solve all the world's problems with psychedelics. There's room for, for enthusiasm and optimism, but we have to be careful. I think that psychedelics um, can allow us to change our attitude towards negative symptoms and change the way we deal with negative emotions. 
And that is something that no other drug seems to be able to do. And so that means that we might be able now, finally, to see through a glass less darkly and to improve the mental health conditions of ourselves and our society. Thank you very much.